In the middle of a busy city, always changing, always moving, you can find a place of stillness. There's been a place of worship on this site for over a thousand years. Although the building itself has changed considerably over time, there's something remarkable about the fact that you can just walk in to a place as old as this. This is a story of Leedsminster, of the people who built it, who are remembered in it, and how in the middle of a busy city, it's a place of stillness for everyone. Our story starts over a thousand years ago. England as a country didn't even exist then. Instead, there were lots of smaller, independent kingdoms who all fought each other. This cross dates from a very chaotic time. It was discovered during building work in the 19th century and has been restored to its full glory. It has elements of both Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian design, and is believed to date from the 10th century, when the Vikings ruled half of England in a kingdom known as a Dane law. There's something extremely powerful about being in the presence of something so old. A building as old as this is like a patchwork quilt of history. So many people and periods of time squished together in one building. This is what makes churches unique. They've been around for so long, and are so central to the local community that they absorb elements from all the different periods of time they witness. This stone knight belonged to a local family. And right next to it is something from around 400 years later. This is a memorial to members of the Hardwick family. These skulls and skeletons are called memento mori and remind us of the inevitability of death. Death, in a way, is something all around us. Literally, the Minster is full of memorials to those who have passed away. Every time I come here, I look at a different memorial. Because each one is a real person. Someone who lived in this city, walked these streets, had dreams, hopes, memories. This church has constantly been built on and changed over time. This current version is rather new, and that's down to one revolutionary preacher. In 1837, a new vicar arrived in Leeds, named Walter Hook. By this point, the church was a little worse for wear. When he visited, he's said to have described it as nasty, dirty, ugly, and old. He said, I seek to exhibit to the world the church in her beauty. Let the services of the church be properly performed and right-minded people will soon come to love her. So he set about rebuilding it. Part of the problem was that it was just too small. The Industrial Revolution caused a population explosion with the number of citizens in Leeds doubling in just 30 years. With cities getting bigger and overcrowded, people soon found that there wasn't enough room for them at local churches. One solution to this was to move the tower from the middle of the church to the front. This gave it a lot more room on the inside, where he could build new seats. In fact, he added a thousand new seats. The gallery seats up here were the most exclusive and rented by the richest families in Leeds. But this wasn't just about getting more people into church. He wanted to make the services themselves more spiritually accessible. Many churches had what's called a rood screen, which is a barrier that separates the congregation from the altar. But Hook wanted this area to be as open and visible as possible so that everyone could see what was going on.
Many churches would also have the choir behind the screen, but here the choir was placed in the open so that everyone could see and hear them. The open space of the chancel allowed people to actually come up and receive communion. Hook believed that the bread and wine of communion was a central part of worship, but at the time, most Anglican churches would only give communion monthly, if that. But Hook was determined to give communion at least once a week. This was quite radical for the time, and Hook was something of a trendsetter, with other preachers looking to Leeds as an example. Today, weekly communion is normal in most churches. This statue in City Square was a way for the city to thank and remember Hook, because as well as caring for the spiritual needs of the community, he also worked on the physical needs. He built over 20 schools, visited the poor and sick during cholera outbreaks, opened a food kitchen, campaigned for better working conditions, and even arbitrated during a miners' strike. Though buried in Sussex, he's remembered with a memorial here. The church closed in 1838 to start the building work, but was ready to reopen in 1841. It was the largest new church in England since St Paul's Cathedral. As many as 400 clergy travelled to witness its reopening. Visitors included Florence Nightingale and the Bishop of New Jersey, who was eager to take these new innovations back with him to America. When the Bishop of Tasmania visited in 1842, he said that he had never seen anything to equal the sublime effect of the Liturgy of the Church of England as performed in the parish church of Leeds, heightened by the attention, the devotion and the decorum of the crowded congregation. That's a story of the revolutionary Dr. Hook, but there's plenty more stories to be discovered. This is a memorial to Woodbine Willie, real name Geoffrey Studdett Kennedy, who was born in Leeds and served as a chaplain during the First World War. He's remembered for his inspiring speeches and having the courage to run into no man's land to help wounded soldiers. This is a memorial to Richard Ostler, also from Leeds, who's known as the Factory King because of his efforts to improve the working conditions for the poorest in society. This is a memorial to Captain Lawrence Oates. His family lived in Leeds and he's most famous for being a member of Captain Scott's ill-fated expedition to the South Pole. Oates was the one who may be some time. This intricately carved memorial is dedicated to two soldiers from Leeds who died during the Battle of Talavera in Spain in 1809. If you're a cricket fan, one of them, Richard Beckett, was the first first-class cricketer to die during military service. There's so many stories to be told here. You discover something new each time you come. But I've saved some of the best till last. As much as this is a place of stillness, it's also a place of tremendous music. From the choir, to the organ, to the concerts that take place, there's always music bouncing between these stones. We've actually been allowed inside the organ, and if you're wondering what it takes to play the music you've been hearing, well, now's your chance. You've got four keyboards, and foot pedals, and all of these little buttons, so needless to say, it's pretty complicated. And this is where all the magic happens. All of these pipes are responsible for producing that wonderful, tumultuous music. I dread to think how they clean them. Bells are used around the world to call people to prayer. I'm only going to give you a teaser of the bell ringing in this tower because I want to bring you a full video on the story of bell ringing and how throughout history it's been the soundtrack to British life. You may have passed by this place and never gone in, or you may have had no idea that it even existed. But if you're looking for a place of quiet contemplation or music to stir the spirit or just a place to sit and chat, I invite you 
come in. Saviour the history around you. 